Greetings, motherfuckers. My name is Chris, and today we're engaging our fun thrusters as we dash off to the land of sand, sick history, and sand. Qatar. But what is the connection between vehicles and nature? How many archaeological sites are there in the country? And you ever think that cars are just like horses but with wheels? What if horses were born with wheels? It'd look weird. Where would the Do you wheels? Do there be go? some horses My mom that drives a car, like wheels on yeah, the head? Want the wheels and the, the legs to be legs like that? Two out of these three questions are going to be answered. So sit down, don't get sand on the towel, and grab some mouthwash with 101 facts about Qatar. Dang. Number one. Even though we already talked about roughly what Qatar is in the intro, what is Qatar? It's not a keyboard guitar hybrid like I may or may not have initially thought, but it is a peninsula on the Arab Peninsula. See the little dingle right there? That's Qatar. Number 2. Continental drift happened a lot, and like 250 million years ago when the continents of the planets were all together as Pangaea, the Arabian Peninsula was tucked snugly between Africa and Eurasia, which granted isn't that much different than today. Number 3. When Pangaea separated into Laurasia and Gondwana, the Arabian plate lost its land connection with Eurasia, and over many, many more time, the plates continued to separate until the African plate pushed the Arabian plate up into the Eurasian plate said plate too many times, it sounds weird. Number 4. The Arabian plate is getting some hugs from the African plate, the Eurasian plate, and the Indian plate. Well, I say hugs, but it's pulling away from Africa like it's getting away from an overbearing parent, cramming itself into the Eurasian plate like it's a thing to do, and being pushed into the Indian plate like a simile. Number 5. Qatar is covered in sand. And no, it's not because Christian Bale keeps vanishing. The main rocks on the peninsula are limestone, and from then is where the loose sand comes from, as well as a lot of pebbles. There are smooth flats in the east that are covered in fine-grained dust, and in the south there are sand dunes and salt flats. In the west, though, there are several hill ridges, or jebels. Number 6. Considering that 100% of the country is land, the country is actually pretty low down. It's not like Dead Sea levels of low, but its highest point is Korain Abul Al Bor, which is only 103 meters above sea level. Number 7. The country's landmass is roughly 11,586 kilometers squared, and has over 2 million people living in that square kilometers. Doha is the capital city of the country, and roughly 80% of them people living in them square kilometers live in Doha. Number 8. Doha itself is only 132 square kilometers, and if I do some quick math, that is at least quite a lot smaller than the rest of the country. To be fair though, the rest of the country is desert, and last I checked, desert is hard to live in. Number 9. There are 8 municipalities in Qatar, and they're called Baladiyat. Going roughly north to south, these are Al Shamal, Al Khor, and Al Thakira, Al Shania, Al Dayen, Um Slal, Doha, Al Rayan, and Al Wakra. Number 10. What's more north than Al Shamal? Well, in general, a lot of things, but in Qatar, nothing else. Shamal literally means north in Arabic, and this is the least populated municipality. It has a hecton of archaeological and protected sites, as well as villages that were abandoned during Qatar's oil boom. Number 11. <laughs> Al Khor and Al Thakira exist and was ruled by a tribe called Al Muhanadi. These guys were the earliest settlers in Al Khor, popping in in 1908. A British historian called J. G. Lorimer visited the region and wrote that the village of Al Khor consisted of 400 mud and stone houses. It was also noted by him that the tribe also settled in Al Thakira. Number 12. Qatar is also known for the mangrove, a heckin' cool tree that grows in salt water. There are a lot of mangrove trees all over the Arabian Peninsula, but in Al Khor and Al Thakira, there is an abundance of these trees, and you can even go kayaking there. Number 13. Al Dayen is a little baby municipality, being only 8 years old as of recording. It was created in 2014, basically. It was built with the aim of being an attractive, sustainable place that balances growth with the protection of environmental assets and the cultural identity of Qatari communities. Number 14. This Baladiyat also has the Lusail iconic stadium that finished construction April last year. It will host the 2022 FIFA World Cup final, and it connects to the Doha Metro Red Line, which we'll cover in a hot minute. Number 15. Camels. They're big, cute looking, got a hump, and in this fact, they run fast. In Al Shania, they race the camels, so much so in fact that the municipality is known for it. The Baladiyat got its name from a plant known as a she. Number 16. 
It's a bit of an odd brag, but Umslal is the only municipality that is completely landlocked. There's a lot of rock formations in this municipality. No! That was an open reaction. There's a lot of rock formations in this municipality, and the name Umslal translates to Mother of Rocks. Number 17. Doha was the first baladiyat that was made, being established in 1963, but it was originally called the Qatar Municipality. The name got changed to Doha later in the year. Number 18. Doha also has a metro system, a red line that goes as far north as Al Khor and as far south as Al Wakra, a golden line that goes east to west, and a green line that sticks around the western area but crosses between the other lines. There is also a blue line planning to be opened in 2027. Number 19. Oh, and here's a pretty interesting curiosity about it. During its construction, the Doha Metro project was awarded the world record for the largest number of tunnel boring machines operating simultaneously in a single project. How exciting. Number 20. Al Rayyan was created in 1972 and is the third largest municipality in the country. The eastern side of the Baladiyat is densely populated, the city of Al Rayyan being here and being tucked snugly next to Doha. The western side of the municipality is sparsely populated, just farms, the occasional settlement, and a heck of a lot of sand. Number 21. The Arabic word Wakar roughly translates into bird's nest, and that's why Al Wakra is called that. There is a nearby hill which several types of birds have been known to nest. Also, the Al Janoub Stadium is here, which will be one of the venues to host the 2022 FIFA World Cup. No, we won't do 101 facts about it, please don't ask. I don't know about you, but please stop asking for us to do 101 facts about the FIFA World Cup. I don't want to do football again. So evidence of the Bronze Age human settlements have been found in the Arab Peninsula. Quite a lot of them, in fact. But not many have been found in Qatar. The al Khor region on the western coast does have a fair few important ones, though. Such as the Jazirat bin Ghanim. Number 23. This island is also known as the Purple Island, and on it there have been found a large quantity of a type of shell belonging to a snail called Murex. The shells are used to create a purple dye. Number 24. Also across the little gulf that's there is the Raz Abruk, the northernmost section of the Zikrit Peninsula. Barberware pottery has been found in a Bronze Age campsite that was discovered there, and the pottery has been dated to the late 3rd millennium BCE. That's like over 4,000 years ago! Number 25. Also sidebar before more history facts happen, there's also a heck of a lot of ostriches here. Like yeah, the Arabian Peninsula has a lot of ostriches anyway, but there's a concentration of them here in Zakrit. The Ministry of Municipality and Environment has even had to advise tourists not to visit during mating season because there's so many of them and they get aggressive. Number 26. If you take a finger and trace it up along the west coast of Qatar, you'll be greeted by this big old square building surrounded by a stone wall. This is Umm al Ma, an archaeological site. The area is most notable for an ancient Bronze Age cemetery. Number 27. So Bronze Age happened and then people started vibing with iron instead. Anyways, following the rise of Islam, the region became subject to the Islamic Caliphate. Number 28. Still not much is known about Qatar's history before the 18th century. Before that, the area was mostly used for Bedouin nomads, except for a few small fishing villages that populated the region. Number 29. So conventionally, 1766 marks the beginning of Qatar's modern history. Why? Because that's notably the year of the big migration of families from Kuwait, aka the Khalifa family, to the peninsula. Number 30. Now, how did the Khalifa manage to gain control of the territories and install the first dynasty of Qatar? Easy! All they had to do was get into the right business. So they turned their settlement in the town of New Al Zabara into a pearl diving and trade center. Number 31. One thing led to another, and in 1783, the family conquered the nearby state of Bahrain, where they remained the ruling family throughout the 20th century. But that's another history. Number 32. Once the Caliph were out of Qatar, the country was ruled by a series of transistory dynasties, meaning lots of sheiks and lots of names I will never be able to pronounce, so let's limit the damage and the humiliation. I'll just tell you that, among others, the most famous was the Rama. The most famous was the Rama in Jabir al Jalahima. See what I mean? Who's remembered for his maritime battles with the Caliph family? And number 33. Eventually, the Tani dynasty, not Tahini, that's the source, gained stable control over the territory in the 19th century. But they didn't do it all by themselves. Fighting against tribal groups and the Ottoman Empire, which occupied the country in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, was a lot! Number 34. 
so they asked for the help of the British. I mean, the plan worked, but the help from the British Empire didn't exactly come free. In exchange for their grand gesture, the United Kingdom had control over Qatar's foreign policy until 1971, when the country ultimately got its independence. Number 35. Not that they stopped having contact with Western powers at that point. Qatar has one of the world's largest reserves of petroleum and natural gases, which supply to many European countries. Number 36. The following decade opened with Qatar joining its five Arab Gulf neighbors in the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, in 1981. The aim of the alliance was to promote economic cooperation and enhance both internal security and external defense. There were, in fact, growing concerns around the Islamic Revolution in Iran and the Iran-Iraq War. Number 37. Then in 1990, the country took part in the Persian Gulf War and, amazingly, the capital of Doha, which served as a base for offensive strikes by French, Canadian and US troops, remained minimally affected by the conflict. Number 38. But lots of other things happened in the 90s. For example, the country signed an agreement with the US government that allowed their military forces to place equipment in several sites throughout the country. According to the permit, the US were also granted use of Qatari airstrips. Number 39. The US was setting the base for the start of the operations in Afghanistan in 2001. As a matter of fact, the agreement was actually formalized only in late 2002. The following year, Qatar became the headquarters for American and Allied military operations in Iraq. Number 40. At the same time, the country faced internal turmoil throughout the 90s. What started as arguments over the distribution of oil revenues escalated to actual clashes that ultimately turned into a proper coup that, in 1995, brought Sheikh Khalifa's son, Sheikh Hamad, to power. Number 41. Still, the new caliphate faced an attempted counter coup only one year after its establishment in 1996. A protracted lawsuit between Hamad and his family over the rightful ownership of billions of dollars of invested oil revenues followed. It was eventually settled out of court, after which Hamad Jr. fully consolidated his power. The meaning of life. Given its historical ties with both the Middle East and Western countries, Qatar acts as a mediator in disputes from time to time. Does their mediation always work? It depends. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Number 43. For example, in 2008, the country did help result a factional standoff in Lebanon that was about to develop into armed conflict. At the same time, only a year before, an agreement brokered by Qatar between the Yemeni government and Houthi rebels fell apart within months. Number 44. And then again, the country hasn't always been impartial. In Libya, for example, Qatar took an active role in supporting the rebellion against the regime of Muammar al-Qaddafi. They provided weapons and funds to the rebels while contributing military assets to the NATO-led mission to enforce a no-fly zone. Number 45. They also sent weapons and financial aid to the rebels of Bashar al-Assad in Syria in 2012. In Egypt, they've been supporting, economically, the Muslim Brotherhood political group. Seriously, they provided billions of dollars to the Muslim Brotherhood-led government of Muhammad Morsi, who was elected in 2012. Number 46. But back to internal matters. In June 2013, Hamad announced his abdication in favor of his 33-year-old son, Sheikh Tamim, starting the need to make way for a new generation of Qatari leaders. Isn't monarchy sweet? Do you wish more people would do that? Number 47. But seriously though, Hamad's decision came across as super weird because normally, rulers in the Gulf Arab region usually occupy their positions for life. Still, he was in charge, so he could pretty much do whatever he wanted. Number 48. Looking at the following challenges his son had to face in the following years, that was probably a smart decision. In June 2017, in fact, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt, and Bahrain cut diplomatic ties to Qatar and imposed an economic blockade. Brutal. But why? Number 49. Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates claimed it was a necessary measure to counter Qatar's alleged support for militant Islamist groups and its friendly relations with Iran. Number 50. Still, Qatar didn't take it too seriously. They refused to comply with the list of demands that were imposed by the other countries. And you know what? It paid off, in the long run. Despite an initial shock that the country's economy suffered, Qatar's wealth and business economy enabled it to absorb early losses and just adjust a tiny bit of its domestic economy. Number 51. An example of how they dealt with the situation practically? Well, here's a weird one. The blockade caused the disappearance of many dairy products from the supermarkets. Naturally, the best solution was to fly thousands of cows into the country to become self-sufficient in dairy. Number 52. On a less extreme level, the country also recurred to readjusting its international relationships, which was probably the most efficient way to go. 
It shifted its trade away from the Gulf countries while increasing the trade with Turkey, Iran, Kuwait, Oman, and Southeast Asia. Number 53. Over the years, their strategy of not giving in paid off. In January 2021, the blockade was lifted. The timing couldn't have been better since the 2022 World Cup is approaching which, as we mentioned, seems to be a big deal for football fans. Number 54. As a matter of fact, the World Cup will be historic for numerous reasons. From Qatar being the smallest country and the first Arab country ever to host the tournament, to being the first World Cup held during winter. It will also be the first carbon neutral World Cup, with an 800 megawatt solar energy plant built to power the tournament. Number 55. Sadly, the setup for the event has not been all fun and games. International attention also means deeper investigation, like the one led by the UN's ILO, the International Labour Organization, in the past few years. Qatar's domestic affairs have, in fact, caused quite a stir recently. Number 56. Especially when it comes to foreign workers subjected to the long-standing kafala labor system that regulates the relationships between employer and migrant workers in many countries in West Asia since the 1950s. Number 57. According to the system, employers have almost total control over migrant workers. In the specific case of Qatar, migrants come mostly from Jordan, Lebanon, and other Arab Gulf countries. Until 2020, these people were forbidden by law from leaving the country or changing jobs without the permission of their employers. Number 58. I don't know about you, but to me, this seems like a human and labor rights violation. I didn't even mention the low wage. Workers can earn as little as $1 an hour. Luckily, international human rights groups pressured the country to reach some changes. Number 59. In late 2017, Qatari officials announced the plans to reform the system and allow international monitoring of labor conditions, and as I mentioned, since 2020, migrant workers have been able to switch jobs and personal plans without employers' permission. Still working on minimum wage, though. Number 60. Okay, this is getting a little heavy, too heavy for our standards. Why don't we move on to some lighter facts? Like, I don't know, that Qatar is the second flattest country in the world? The first place, with a high point of only 6 feet, goes obviously to the Maldives. But Qatar is right behind it with its lowest point at just 338 feet. Number 61. Still nothing is permanent and, weirdly, while other territories are literally losing grounds, Qatar is getting higher. It's not like it's gaining centimeters every night, but compared to 400 years ago, the country is 2 meters higher. That's due to geological uplift. Number 62. It might not seem like a big deal to you, but it's still quite impressive, especially for a peninsula with a coastline of 563 kilometers, meaning it's mostly surrounded by water. Number 63. With a coastline that long, it surely makes sense that Qatar hosts one of the places in the world where the sea meets desert, Khor Al Adaid. Nintendo 64. There, the sand dunes merge with inland sea, creating a visual spectacle. In fact, the government is trying to get the area, a nature reserve since 2007, to be named a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Number 65. Record-wise, the Olympic cycling track in Doha holds the Guinness World Record for longest continuous cycle path in the world. The track, created by Ashgal, the Public Works Authority in Qatar, was completed in just 27 days, 10 of which of continuous work. Number 66. Inaugurated in 2020, the track is 33 kilometers long and it runs through 18 underpasses to ensure uninterrupted movement. Number 67. Oh, and the country also holds the record for the longest piece of asphalt concrete laid continuously. Used in construction of the track, it is 25.3 kilometers long. Number 68. The runway at HIA, Hamad International Airport, is not falling behind. At 15,912 feet, it's the longest runway in Western Asia and the sixth longest runway in the world. Plus, it has the pleasure of lying within the walls of the best airport in the world. Well, according to Skytrack's World Airport Awards in 2021, at least. Number 69. The cow goes moo. Apparently, it's not a matter of smooth, comfortable journeys, which, to be fair, are like the basics of flying. Or at least it should be. It's the art installation spread all over the airport to seal the deal, like the two flying man sculptures at the arrivals meet and greet hall. Number 70. They sit atop two pillars designed to look like those found in ancient Mesopotamia. Created by Iraqi artist Dia al Azawi, the works reference Abu Furnas, one of the early pioneers of flight in the Islamic world. Number 71! There's also a giant teddy bear with a lamp on its head because why not? The giant artwork has been reported to cost $6.8 million and weighs almost 20 tons. Why are you asking why? Number 72. 
Still, all the sculptures contribute to the airport's fame. The Skytrack World Airport Awards 2021 also awarded the HIA with the title of Best Airport in the Middle East, Best Airport with 25 to 35 million passengers, and Best Airport Staff in the Middle East. Number 73. Art and planes are cool, but the big deal for the Qatari are cars. In fact, they're even planning to build a Qatar Auto Museum along the 56 Expressway. Though to be fair, there is one already, sort of. Number 74. At Al Wakair Scrapyard, you'll find more than 20,000 abandoned vehicles in various states of decay. Some have been mined for spare parts, while others are still intact. A surreal view, a car cemetery that merges with nature. Number 75. Did you know that only 15% of the population of the country is Qatari? Yeah, Qatar is indeed attractive to those who are looking for warm weather, a laid-back lifestyle, and, of course, tax-free salaries. This is, of course, if you're a top-rated worker. We've mentioned the struggle of migrant workers before. Number 76. The population is mostly made of men. According to the censored figures from December 2020, in fact, men outnumber women in Doha by about 3 to 1. For a total of just 811,600 women in a population of 2,846,118. Number 77. That's a huge difference compared to the women-men ratio in the world, which is about 102 men for 100 women. In fact, Qatar has the highest male-to-female ratio in the world. Number 78. Oh, look at me, I'm here rambling about men and women disparity, and I almost forgot to mention a very important thing. How could I forget about Qatar's national animal? Seriously though, it is the Arabian Oryx, and they're super cute. Number 79. Plus their survivors. In the 1970s, they were on the verge of extinction, but zoos and reserves saved them and turned them into more than just national animals. The Arabian Oryx is more of a brand today. Number 80. You can spot it on the Qatar Airway logo, for example. And maybe sports fan will remember that the Oryx was the mascot for the 206 Asian Games in Doha. Number 81. On the other hand, camel racings are still a big thing in the country. The races take place at Al Shahania Camel Racing Track between October and February every year. But hey, at least they've taken children off from the jockey duty. Number 82. Yeah, originally camels were ridden by children. Since 2004, robots have taken over the job. You know, it was kind of dangerous for the kids. Camel herders control the robot jockeys remotely while driving alongside the track. Number 83. Qatar's national dish is marjbous, made with rice, onions, meat, either lamb or chicken and tomatoes, all mixed with spices. The secret is all in its slow cooking that enriches each flavor. Number 84. Here's something we haven't mentioned yet. Where does the flag of Qatar come from? While the nine serrated edges symbolize Qatar's inclusion as the ninth member of the reconciled emirates of the Persian Gulf that happened in 1916. Number 85. The reddish sort of purple-brown color on the right refers to the country's role in the purple dye industry. Remember the shellfish dye of the Alcor Islands? The color is so unique it has its own name, Qatar Maroon, or Pantone 1955C. Number 86. The white color on the left reflects the internationally recognized symbol of peace. But the most surprising thing is that the flag is the only world ah, the flag is the only one worldwide to have a width more than twice the size of its height. Number 87. The first school in Doha was officially established in 1949. There was only one teacher for 50 students. Wait, does it mean up to until that point the kids had no place to study? Nah, they simply used centers for education that had been available way before the 20th century. Number 88. Similarly, the first hospital opened in 1947. Well, the one established by the American Mission because the first governmental hospital was established only in 1957, and it still operates today and retains its status as Doha's oldest remaining hospital. Number 89. Here's another fun fact, we got plenty of them. Apart from the mangrove forest in Alcor Island, which to be fair is more of a greenery area rather than a forest, Qatar has no forests. In fact, it is one of only the four territories in the world with no forests. Most of the trees and green landscapes are human-made. Number 90. Just like for trees, the prevailing desert environment of the country is not suitable for fresh water. There are, in fact, no lakes or other permanent bodies of fresh water in Qatar. The country gets its drinking water from distillation plants where sea water is processed to remove the salt. Number 91. What's with Qatar and long things? And no, I'm not joking. Looks like their obsession with the length of stuff has also led to a 100 meter long buffet. Ordered by the Doha Marriott, the buffet line features every cuisine, from a full English breakfast to sushi and tacos. I want to go to there. Number 92. Still, probably you won't find any mimosa or any other alcoholic drink to accompany the meal. 
In fact, drinking in public is illegal in the country. Only a few licensed bars and restaurants serve it, mostly in a five-star hotel, and foreigners can purchase it for consumption at home but with a permit. Number 93 Hey, it's not the end of the world. There are still plenty of soft drinks and coffee you can go for. Yeah, Qatari love coffee. They even produce their own unique blend, the gawa, literally coffee in Arabic. It's made from dark roasted Arabica beans. It is usually served black with sugar and is poured from a traditional metal pot, the dala, into small cups, the finjan. Number 94 The beverage is also a symbol of hospitality, hence it's usually served to guests in houses and in the lobbies of hotels. But there are other popular drinks too. The karak, for example, is similar to chai tea. It consists of black tea, evaporated milk, and spices like cardamom and saffron. Number 95 The education system of Qatar is divided between public and private schools. Government-funded schools are overseen by the SCE, Supreme Education Council, and they're free, but not compulsory. However, they're very difficult to access for non-Qataris, as they teach in Arabic only. Number 96 Finally, it's worth mentioning a few futuristic structures that have made the country famous worldwide. For example, the Qatar National Library, which has over 2 million books and many ancient maps and texts. It's shaped like a spaceship. Number 97 Opened in 2019, the National Museum of Qatar resembles the Desert Rose Crystal, typical of the area, and it was designed by world-famous architect Jean Nouvelle. Number 98 Just like the Doha Tower or Burj Doha, which does not look like the Desert Rose, in fact, it has more of a cylindrical shape and Islamic patterns on its exterior, but it was also designed by Jean Nouvel in 2012. At night, the building is lit up and looks just stunning. Number 99 But what makes the 46-story tower unique is that the structure has no central core. On the contrary, the skyscraper is the first in the world to use internal reinforced concrete diagrid columns. Wow, it's number 100. But you know what, despite all these incredible architectonic buildings, the majority of Qatari real estate investments are abroad, mostly in London. The Qatari royal family itself has a house in the capital of England for an estimated worth of $313 million. It is number 101. Actually, Qatar tops the Queen's real estate possession in London. In fact, the country owns more than three times the properties than the Queen, which makes Qatar the biggest landlord in London. So that was 101 facts about Qatar. Did you learn many things? Did you learn any things? Why don't you let me know in the comments down below? And while you're down there, why not just give us a like and subscribe to this channel, 101 Facts? Because it's cool and stuff. And anyway, whoosh out! On screen right now are two videos that you can consume with your face. Just, you know, usual drill. Just open up in separate tabs. Watch them at the same time. Unfocus your eyes. They'll become the same video and have fun. See you later.